Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. You know, although charter schools have been around for 30 years, over the last two years, COVID and poor testing of students across the nation has focused more attention to parental involvement and education of their children and the increasing desire of school choice, seeking alternatives to public schools. We're joining me in a conversation to explore charter schools is Nina Rees, who is the CEO and president of the National Alliance for public charter schools. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Bob, and I'm sorry I'm not with you in person. Wonderful. Well, before we get into some of the specifics, I wonder if you would kind of explain to us what your uh, organization, the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools, tell us about your organization, please. Great. Thanks again for having me, Bob. The National Alliance for Public Charter Schools is the national advocacy arm of the charter school movement. Uh, we were set up primarily to advocate at the federal level uh, for charter schools. Uh, when charter schools were first born, uh, President Bill Clinton was running for, or Governor Clinton at the time was running for office, uh, and he was a huge advocate of them. And since his uh, presidency, every president has been a huge advocate, and there's been a lot of involvement at the federal level through funding to support the growth of charter schools. So we do federal advocacy, we do state advocacy. Ultimately, charter laws are created because states have passed statutes uh, governing their creation. Uh, we also do quite a bit of education about what charter schools are uh, and uh, to make sure that the common, you know, the public is aware of what they are and how great they are for education. Well, you know, I saw one of your surveys showed that 93% of parents value school choice and your survey found 86% of all parents do indeed want options to their current public school situation. Those are very strong numbers indeed. They are, and not surprising, quite frankly, when you ask people whether they would like to have more options rather than fewer options, of course, people are going to agree with the idea of having more options. But what's interesting about our survey this time around is that we also discovered that among registered voters who happen to be parents, uh, those voters this time in the midterms would be willing to vote for a candidate outside of their party if that candidate agreed with them on issues of choice and education. So for the first time, education is rising to the top uh, of the set of issues that voters and certainly parents care about. And I think it's a great moment in time to see uh, if politicians respond to this renewed interest in education and in school choice. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, there was a Harris uh, poll that 83% of parents say education has indeed become a political issue. But you know what's interesting? There does seem to be a little bit of a political divide. Uh, Gallup poll in September, Republican satisfaction with K through 12 is only at 30%, Democrats at 57%. And so there does seem to be, in terms of the impression and need, difference between the two parties. Yes, um, but when you disaggregate the results among Democrats, uh, Blacks and Latinos who are registered Democrat voters are the biggest supporters of charter schools and school choice. And for good reason, they happen to be in neighborhoods uh, where there aren't a lot of options. You're assigned to one school. And if that school doesn't fit your needs, uh, you really don't have any other options, especially if you don't have the means to move to another school district. So when you disaggregate the results of the democratic portion of the population, you do see huge support for charter schools among Latinos and among blacks. Well, uh, approximately how many charter schools do you know that are nationwide? We have a little over 7,700 public charter schools right now uh, around the country. We have laws in 45 states and in Washington, DC. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier, the laws uh, have been around uh, for about 30 years now. The first one passed in Minnesota. Uh, and we've seen a huge um, you know, growth in chartering and certainly uh, a huge bump in enrollment in charter schools when the pandemic hit. Uh, in that year, uh, 240,000 um, students enrolled in charter schools, while the overall population in the uh, district-run system re was reduced by about 1.3 million. So parents wanted more options and charter schools certainly uh, fit their needs in the different communities where that option was available. Well, you know, for those who, a lot of the terms kind of come together. Uh, so for example, 
Um, we hear about, and my sister teaches uh, in a charter school in North Carolina, but we hear about governor schools as private schools. We know the difference. Lab schools that the Virginia governor is, is um, pronouncing that he would like to see uh, established here. Can you kind of help us to understand among those differences, what is unique in terms of and makes a charter school? Well, that's a great question. So public schools, of course, are public. They're governed by school districts and elected officials who are you know, part of the school boards of those districts, unless the school system is run by a mayor. Uh, private schools, of course, are private. Uh, and uh, you know, about 10% of the student population is in a private school setting right now. Mm -hmm. um, governor schools are and magnet schools uh, are run and operated by school districts. They're still schools of choice uh, and they are targeted often at, um, you know, in the case of governor school students who have certain skills and interests academically. Uh, so they are not necessarily open to all. Uh, the key difference I would say between a charter school and these other options is the fact that charter schools are often governed by, by an entity other than a school district. The school district usually has the ability to authorize charter schools, but in most states where we've seen a growth in the number of charter schools, the state education agency has had the authority to also open charter schools uh, or a nonprofit or a university. Now, you mentioned lab schools. So depending again on the state that you're in, there are different definitions of a lab school. Usually it's a school that's been created by a teacher education college uh, in order for those teachers to operate a school. Here in Virginia, after the amendments made to the last law that was passed, um, any university can start a lab school you still need to get the districts involved. And the governor also made some funding available to incentivize the creation of lab schools. So it's not just uh, universities that have a teacher education program, but any university that wants to create a school is now able to do so. You know, so the thing is that charter schools are public schools. Yes, they're public schools, and that's probably the biggest misconception out yeah. there. The 30 years of being in place, a lot of people still don't know that it's public. It is open to all, no admission standards. If they have more students than they have seats, they have to conduct a lottery. Um, so in that sense, they bring the best of public education, but also uh, they fit the needs of families. So I'm, I live near Washington, DC, I'm in Northern Virginia. In Washington, DC, close to 50% of the student population is in a charter school. And when you go to Ward 7 and 8 in Washington, DC, you see a huge menu of options available. You have some that are uh, focused more on science and technology, some that are focused on uh, languages, some that are focused on adult learners, some that are focused on Montessori. So uh, that breadth of options is something that's very unique uh, and something that certainly has opened the door to a lot of opportunities for low-income families in DC, but also for a lot of affluent families who up until recently were moving out of DC to Northern Virginia or to Maryland in order to access better public schools because of the charter school system in Washington, D.C., these families are now staying in the public school system in Washington, D.C. Well, you know, I hear a common argument that, wait a minute, wait a minute, if, if, if we support charter schools, takes money, public money away from the education. But that's not really true, is it? Or is it depend upon state by state in terms of the funding and support of the charter school? Well, that's a great question. So charter schools are public schools. These are public funds that are made available for the education of the students in the system. And we believe that, you know, if, if the district run system is not meeting the needs of families, those families ought to have options. And so long as that education is offered in the public sphere, that you're accountable to an authorizer that, uh, that holds, holds the school accountable, uh, then the fact that it's happening in a charter school versus a district run school shouldn't necessarily uh, matter. Um, and but that is a point of contention that's been going on for a while. And, you know, my hope and we've seen this in a few districts where superintendents have embraced charter schools. Um, you know, if you're a forward looking leader who's in it for the sake of the families in the system, you want to create these schools because ultimately they're shielded and running independently from a lot of the politics that takes place 
in a school district run system. Uh, and so in that sense, when you look at the performance of some of our best charter schools, the reason why they've stayed uh, around and they've thrived and are serving so many families with so many more families on wait lists is because of the fact that their leadership is not contingent upon the whims of a school board, an elected school board, uh, or a superintendent who's only in office for a few years. So um, some would say, now you said that it's open enrollment. Yes. Um, not restrictive unless they run out of spaces and then it might use a lottery. But the argument that some this is a way that for some charter schools to cherry pick, quote, better students, that's not valid either, is it? No, they cannot cherry pick. Um, if, as I, as I said earlier, if they have more students than they have seats, they have to conduct a lottery. Um, and um, there are, in some instances, there is a sibling preference in place. But beyond that, you cannot cherry pick the students who attend your school. Well, um, so what, um, what are some of the advantages of charter schools then over public schools from your perspective? Well, there's so many advantages. First of all, as we talked earlier, these are schools of choice, which means you're not forced to attend them um, and parents are selecting them because they're fitting their, the needs of their students, whatever those needs may be. So you're not forcing anyone to go to a charter school. If they don't have enough students in seats, they cannot stay open. Also, an authorizer authorizes them. Again, it can be a school district, it can be a state education agency or a nonprofit. And those entities are responsible for the well being of the school, which means that in addition to comporting with state standards and accountability systems, that that school has to meet the terms of its contract, often centered around raising student achievement. If those are not met, that charter can be closed. I would say that's the key difference really between public and charter schools and that if our schools are not attracting enough families or are not performing well academically or any other reason, they can be closed. And a lot of them have been closed over time for those reasons. Well, can you say from, um, is there a higher graduation rate or a better graduation rate from charter yes. schools and public schools? Absolutely. And so, again, after 30 years of chartering, we now have a lot of data about charter schools. When uh, So there are different sets of studies that have been conducted, one by Stanford University, uh, which has looked at charter schools over time in different jurisdictions, comparing the students in charter schools to similar students in public school systems. And over time, what they've noticed is that in inner city settings, the performance of charter school students far surpass surpasses those of students in district schools. So similar students, same demographics, same socioeconomic background, we do better academically compared to them. And, the, and this researcher has also been able to equate uh, or translate what that means into additional days of learning in math and in reading. So by far, everywhere where you have a concentration of charter schools in inner city settings, you're seeing these huge bumps in achievement by state standards. Now, there are also randomized field trials in those places where you have wait lists and you have over enrollment. Uh, so Boston and New York City have done these. These are studies done by Harvard University and other elite institutions. And again, here, because you're controlling for parental engagement, one of the key criticisms we get is that, well, obviously you're going to do better because the parents who are selecting these schools are more engaged. But when you do a randomized field test, you are attracting families who get in who are engaged and those who are not able to enroll their kids because of over enrollment. So you're able to compare apples to apples. Here again, you notice huge improvements. So it, something about the school is making a difference in the academic achievement of the students. And then graduation rates. So that is one of the key things that a lot of charter leaders focused on to make sure that students are not just graduating, but going to and through college. And that is increasingly one of the things that's talked about in those instances where the, the charter school is a high school and sending kids to college. And what I love about our sector is that, you know, once they, once they graduate students, they're not just kind of saying, okay, well, you know, you're now off and on your own. They track those families to see what they do. And if they notice, for instance, that they're going to schools that are not meeting their needs or they're dropping out of school, they have figured out ways to make sure that those first generation students often are sticking with the choices that they made and they're selecting higher ed institutions that fit their needs. 
And the other issue that's now increasingly being discussed is just entering the workforce. You know, college is not for everyone. And in those instances, again, where, you know, um, leaders are engaged in the discussions around poverty and getting students out of um, out of poverty, these discussions on where are they going, what types of jobs are available to them, and how do we make sure that they are in a better place from a socioeconomic standpoint compared to their families is increasingly being discussed. Well, for, from a structural standpoint, so better graduation rate, better test performance on standardized tests in terms of the, of the like the SOLs in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Is the teacher-student ratio better in charter schools than in public schools generally? They are. So again, depending on the jurisdiction that you're in, it's going to vary. But no, uh, the, the, the ratios are usually no different. But the size of charter schools tends to be smaller. Um, so, And I also think that the, there is a lot to be said about the the cultural aspects of the school, the safety, the a sense of nurturing. Again, if you're a school of choice, you want to attract families to your school. So you're going to be a lot more in tune to what families want and need from you. Uh, so in that respect, I do think um, that they just have a more customized approach to education. And can we say that the expense or the money allocated per student um, there's not a big advantage. I mean, a lot of teachers say from I, out of my pocket, I have to buy pencils. I have to bring paper. I have, to, we have such small operating budget. Are they enhanced in charter schools? I guess what I'm trying to say from a perspective, are there advantages of charter school that are systemic um, in addition to some of the things that you had mentioned? Well, from a financial standpoint, I'm glad you brought that up. We get about 70 cents of every dollar that follows students to traditional schools. So we are operating at, at a deficit. That percentage drops to 60 cents on the dollar in some jurisdictions. And unfortunately, what that means is that the school leader also has to make up the gap through fundraising and philanthropy. So we are operating at a disadvantage, but punching way above our weights as a result. Um, so those factors around, you know, teachers having to, you know, fundraise and whatnot still exist in charter schools. But I do think the other thing that charters have done effectively is attract a lot of individuals who believe in a public education, but have simply given up on some of the systemic things we've done to fix traditional schools. Again, I'm in this not because I want to pit one sector against the other. I firmly believe that public schools are going to be perfect for a lot of kids. But if a school is not performing well, and you look at the data, most of the schools that are chronically failing have been chronically failing for a very long period of time. So to think that funding alone is going to fix them is not is incorrect. It's a fallacy. So I believe that in those instances, you have to make more options available. And that ultimately, through that mean, you'll be able to improve the overall quality of education in those communities. And in terms of teacher credentials and what have you, um, is there, and we know that there's a tremendous teacher shortage, um, especially across the nation, quite frankly. Um, but would you say that the teachers are better credentialed in charter schools and public schools? I know that may be uh, getting a little bit uh, dangerous there in no, terms no, no, of answering. That, that, that's a great question. So again, every law is different. Some states require you to comport with the same rules and regulations. We believe those those laws that are strong are the ones that give the school district or the I'm sorry the charter school the autonomy to hire qualified individuals to teach at their schools without the traditional rules and regulations that come with certification or are open to alternative certification routes. Uh, so in that respect, we are able to attract better talent because in you know like Liberty Common in Colorado is a great example. When you walk into Liberty Common, the principal um, is big into talking about the qualifications of the teachers in the classroom as former college professors who would not be able to teach in a traditional system, but who are able to teach at Liberty Common because of the flexibilities that Liberty Common has. The other thing that charter schools do really well is to compensate high quality teachers at a higher percentage points. And so most teachers 
should get paid more if they're doing a better job academically. And the starting salary of the teacher, usually in most places, it's high, but their ability to get raises and to get higher pay for greater work is usually not in place or it's not happening in tandem in a consistent way. So that's the other thing that charter schools have at their disposal. But the other thing that's really important to note is when you talk to teachers in charter schools who have taught in district run schools, one of the things they like is the freedom and flexibility they have to come up with different ways of teaching, testing different pedagogies and whatnot, uh, and not beholden to the rigid rules and regulations that districts often hand schools. So um, let's move to curriculum. Some may specialize, you say it may be technology, it may be science, STEM education, what have you. But generally, um, I guess the state guidelines is this, in terms of content and curriculum, pretty much the same uh, that is taught in charter and, yes. and public schools? Yes, no, as public schools, they have to comport with the same standards and accountability systems. They have to administer the same test, yes. Um, you know, it seems, and you can correct me because Virginia, of course, is a right to work state, but it seems like the teacher unions um, are kind of anti um, charter schools um, and really see charter schools as a threat. What do you think? Yes, you had to bring them in. Um, yes, so they, they have. So what's ironic is Al Shanker, the founder, or I'm sorry, the past president, the late president of the American Federation of Teachers, was one of the early uh, adopters and and pro proponents of charter schools for the reason I was just mentioning, which is that these schools would be able to give teachers more freedom and autonomy uh, to, to experiment and do things that are innovative in service to their students. Um, but over time, as the concentration of charter schools in some districts has increased, they have increasingly uh, you know, voiced their opposition to charter schools, primarily because in a lot of states, charter schools don't have to hire unionized teachers. This is not the case everywhere. Maryland, for instance, does not allow you to, um, uh, to hire teachers who are not unionized. Kansas is another example. Hawaii is another example. But by and large, in most states, you don't have to be part of a union in order to teach at a charter school. So in that sense, again, the school has more freedom and autonomy to expand the school day school year without negotiating with a collective uh, bargaining unit. So I read, and I'm not trying to make this political, but I'm, I'm, I'm more curious about the intent of what I read in terms, it says that Biden administration is proposing new regulations for the establishment at the federal level that might have a chilling effect upon charter schools. Can you speak to that? What What is that concern? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, President Clinton was a big supporter of charter schools. President Bush, President Obama was probably one of the greatest champions for charter schools and certainly President Trump. But President Biden was brought into office with the support of both teacher unions. And his uh, wife, of course, is also a card carrying member of the National Education Association. And so in that respect, they're not as vocal in terms of their um, support for charter schools. With that said, Delaware actually has a very robust charter school sector uh, and um, the president's uh, friends from Delaware, Senators Kuhn and Senator Carper, are both big supporters of charter schools, by the way. I just wanted to throw that in. So um, these rules that were introduced earlier this year were intended to do a couple of things. One of them was to make sure that the money that the federal government was giving to states and district to open charter schools was not going to charter schools that would eventually close. There's no way to know if a charter that's getting funding is going to close. We're very proud of the fact that if our schools open and they're not performing well, that they should not stay open. So you don't wanna create a scenario where you're only giving money to those safest bets out there in public education. With that said though, the other thing that they did in the process of uh, regulating the program is to come up with a whole host of new ideas that have never worked for the chartering system. One of which for instance, was to get a letter of support from school districts. Of course, school districts are not gonna necessarily be open to sending a letter of support to open a competition across the street from their public schools. And so some of them just simply didn't make sense. It was 
potentially uh, part of, you know, they were trying to do a lot at the same time. We, of course, raised opposition. We brought parents, letters, uh, school leaders to explain the situation. And fortunately, the administration was able to make some changes to these rules. With that said, these are rules that are going to make it more complicated for people who are not familiar with the regulatory process to apply for funds. Um, I used to work at the Department of Education back in 2001, 2002. And back then, I thought the, this particular program, and you know, back then, we were big supporters of charter schools. We thought that back then, the number of rules and regulations attached to how you should apply and get the money were high. Now it's become even more complicated. So you have to really know how to apply and hire someone to help you apply for them. So if you're a state education agency that's well-resourced, you'll be able to figure out how to apply and get the funds. But if you're an individual who's applying for the first time, that's when it's gonna get tricky because if you don't know the language, if it's new, you know, a lot of these buzzwords are not easy to understand, then you may not get your money or you may not even bother to apply. I'm sorry, believe it or not, that's all the time we have. A wide ranging discussion. I certainly want to thank my special guest, Nina Reeves, who is CEO and president of the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools. And I want to thank you for joining us and hope you will do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.